Uh, welcome to the first 2010-11 uh, uh, academic runs for Department of Theologic Sciences. Dr. Goldemick could not be here today, so uh, I introduce myself. Uh, everybody, almost everybody knows me here. I'm Kuro Shafter. I'm one of the urologists at uh, Children's. Um, <clears throat> today we're going to talk about testicular tumors in children and adolescents. Uh, so basically we are talking nuts. Um, we are going to talk about epidemiology, pathology, diagnosis, clinical course management, and how these tumors could be different in terms of uh, biology, management, and <clears throat> clinical approach from adults. Um, what actually um, uh, prompted me to do this rounds was that in summer we had a rash of uh, testicular tumor coming to children from different part of province and um, uh, brought up maybe maybe a refresher is uh, needed here. So um, what is interesting about pediatric testicular tumor is that uh, about 30, 40 years ago the need of having a registry was actually um, felt and fulfilled because these are rare tumors, rather rare tumors. And having any meaningful data on them means that you have to put together a lot of cases. There are many of these uh, registries around uh, which in the course of these last four decades have resulted in um, better management and understanding of the, uh, of the disease. Uh, one of them is the Preparatal Tumor Registry of the Section of Urology of uh, American Academy of Pediatrics, which is mainly a North American registry. Armed Forces Testicular Tumor Registry, which was uh, spearheaded by Dr. Mostofi. Um, the Children's Oncology Group and UK Children's Study Group, they all have registries and <clears throat> good data uh, has come out of all, all of these registries. One thing that became apparent by looking at the registries is that the prepubertal uh, tumors are different beasts when you compare them to the postpubertal ones. The postpubertal ones basically follow the na natural history and bi biological behavior of the adult testicular tumors. So the the, the way the testicular tumor in children are classified are very close to what we see in the textbooks for adult tumors, but um, also a little bit different. So it, it depends on the uh, cell of origin. It could be the germ cell, it could be the sex cord, the stromal cells, or it could be paratesticular. They can be benign or malignant. For example, in the benign germ cell tumor, you see teratoma, which is not considered a benign tumor in adults, but in prepubertal uh, kids is always benign. The most common malignancy is the yolk sac tumor. We are going to go to details of all this tumor in a second. <clears throat> Prepubertal testicular tumors are rare, it's up to 2% of all pediatric solid tumors. And so by solid tumors, you know, we mean excluding le leukemias. Um, about uh, the instance, about uh, one per 100,000. And uh, the median age of uh, presentation is two years. For certain tumors, this is actually a little bit lower, like yolk sac tumor, the median age is 13 months, and teratoma is 16 months of age. They are not fatal tumors, with the mortality is one per 10 million per year overall. Um, as I said, the postpubertal tumor are very similar in most aspects uh, to the adult testicular tumors, with the one exception, and that's a rhabdomyosarcoma, um, of the paratesticular elements that we see more often in the second decades uh, of life, so in teenagers. So some of you guys are dealing with um, younger ad adults uh, may see this tumor from time to time. Um, I don't know if you guys at VGH see this tumor, uh, Alan or Peter, do you see it, a lot of this tumor, uh, like rhabdomyosarcoma, paratesticular elements? 
when you look at the instance of different type of pubertal tumors, if you look at the registries, you see that about 60% of them are reported to be malignant, and most of these are um, yolk sac, and 40% of them are benign. But there has been a recent, um, um, a couple of recent studies, and a major um, pediatric centers in um, uh, North America have looked at their own uh, numbers, and the old numbers have been challenged. Uh, like the recent multi study uh, in 2004 by Paul, which looked at sick kids, um, Philadelphia, Boston, and Washington, they and they had over 200 cases, and 75% of those were benign. So uh, everybody thinks that the registries are a little bit biased toward malignant uh, tumors because they, are, they tend to be reported more often, as opposed to if you find an epidermoid cyst, you don't tend to, uh, it's likely that you don't report it to these um, registries. So there is a probably a selection bias and the 75% benign tumors are probably a bit more, um, a bit closer to the truth. Um, this is again from the study by Paul. Uh, in this study, the most common tumor, benign or malignant, was teratoma, followed by epidermoid cysts, which is again benign. Only 15% of these tumors were yolk sac, which are malignant. Um, a juvenile granulosa cell tumor is also a benign tumor, and then less than 5% rare tumors, late cell tumors, Sertoli cell tumors, and mixed gonadal stromal cell tumors. Um, <clears throat> the etiology and genetics of this tumor are very variable. Uh, teratomas uh, are usually not associated with any particular genetic uh, abnormalities. Uh, in yolk sac, um, deletion of the short arm of uh, chromosome 1 is seen and also abnormalities in chromosome 3. Uh, in, as opposed to the post-pubertal germ cell tumor and your sac and mixed cells that are uh, usually associated with chromosome 11, 13, 8, um, 7, 8, and X abnormalities. So even at the level of the genome, these are different tumors. Um, the most common uh, abnormality that we see in pediatric tumors is called I12P, which is an um, isochromosome, so an extra copy of 12P uh, are seen in these tumors. Recently, they have been, people have looked at the incidence of um, these tumors, there has been shown that there is an increasing, a creep toward increasing incidence. And a lot of people are talking about environmental factors being a risk factor in teratogen uh, teratogenesis. Um, nobody has really pinpointed a, a certain substance and material, but at least this is coming out from the epi epidemiological data. The other big risk factor is intersex disorders, especially when the gonad con contains Y chromosome. This is like AR or androgen resistance syndrome, um, or uh, the, the, the famous one is uh, gonadal dysgenesis, uh, mixed gonadal dysgenesis, which is a 45XO, 46XY mosaicism. About 10% of these patients uh, by age of 20 will have a tumor, about 20 to 25% of them, they have a lifetime um, uh, chance of getting a tumor. About 6% of them, when the gonad is uh, removed around puberty or early adulthood, will show carcinoma in situ in them. So uh, that's why um, in uh, most centers, the street gonads of the um, mixed gonadal dysgenesis are recommended to be removed, and also the same thing for if, you, if somebody has testicular feminization. Um, and the other one, uh, risk factor that you see a lot in the textbooks, in the papers, in uh, adult uh, testicular tumor is cryptocritism, but that's really not an issue in kids because, uh, um, again, it will take time for cryptorchid uh, testes to become malignant. Alan? Okay. Yeah. Well, 
I've come across, I've come across, yes, people have looked at it, but what they found, I can't tell you right now. I can't really remember. I can't tell. I can't remember right now off the top of my head. It's steady. Yes. Mm, no, it's not. I'm going to get to that in a second. It's a very good question. Um, so, in terms of pathology, I'm just going to go through a few of these tumors. Well, York sac tumor is the most common prepubertal malignant tumor. Um, there are many other names for it, like orchioblastoma, endodermal, sinus tumor, embryonal uh, adenocarcinoma. The hallmark is that here the germ cells have been um, developed into extra embryonic uh, structures. And so uh, structures that are usually you see outside the embryo uh, on the placental side. Um, there is uh, epithelial and mesenchymal cells in an organate fashion and this organate fashion, the, the one that is uh, the hallmark of this um, tumor is the Schiller Duval bo body, which is a papillary uh, type of a structure with a fibrovascular core and two cell layer of m malignant cells around it. So this is the core and two layers of cell around it. Um, there are also cytoplasmic uh, inclusions that, that can be seen with high power and those are a uh, conglomeration of alpha phytoprotein inside the cytoplasm of these cells. Teratoma um, is a tumor that is characterized by more than one embryologic layer of cells. So endoderm, ectoderm, and mesoderm uh, derived structures can be seen there. It could be mature, it could be immature. And I have seen people, even our own oncologists at Children's, using the term immature uh, interchangeably with malignant. But that's not true. The immature, even the immature teratomas are usually benign prepubertally. Um, all it means is that there are immature tissue in the tumor, which is usually the neuroepithelium. Um, but uh, when the degree of immaturity goes up, you have um, a higher chance of finding malignant foci of yolk sac tumor in this tum in, in teratoma. So that's, uh, I think, where the confusion is coming from. There are two um, slides showing mature teratoma with cartilage formation, which is a mesenchymal uh, origin, and then immature teratoma with epithelial and blastemal elements um, that have not really formed a mature uh, recognizable pattern. What we see a lot of children is epidermoid cyst. Um, it's a, basically a monolayer teratoma. It's a differentiated squamal cell line cyst, and in, the cyst is actually filled with this creatine debris. Um, both the classical teratoma and epidermoid cyst are not associated with intratubular gel cell neoplasia. So going back to your question, John, uh, tumors that are usually risk factor for further cancer development, um, the, the, what they have in common is actually you see this type of uh, neoplasia in the testicular tissue around them. But in teratoma and epidermoid cyst, that has not been reported. Um, another peculiar tumor that um, we see in um, kids from time to time is gonadoblastoma. This is also a benign tumor and um, is usually seen in um, kids with gonadal dysgenesis. And it has germ cell and stromal cell at the same time. And the germ cell part of it can actually be the, uh, where the malignancy occurs, and it's usually dysgerminoma or seminoma, but gonadoblastoma itself, it's benign. Sex cord stromal tumors are the tumors that are not from germ cells. Uh, there's a peculiar type of it, again, in kids, it's called ju uh, juvenile granulosa cell tumors. This is the most common t testicular tumor in neonates. It's benign. 
Uh, and it's a very interesting tumor because granulosa cells should not be in the testis. Granulosa cells are coming from the epithelium of ovary, and nobody really knows why you get this granulosa type cell in, a, uh, in this tumor in the testis. Um, the other one uh, also is Leydig cell tumor that is seen in adult, uh, adults as well. Uh, the Reinecke crystals, they're in, uh, inter against cytopl cytoplasmic inclusion bodies that are, very, uh, that are the hallmark of this um, tumor. Uh, in kids, as a rule, is they're usually benign and they could be hormonally active, causing precocious puberty or gynecomastia in kids as well. And that's actually usually one of the prominent presentation of boys with this tumor. Sertoli cell tumors are also another type of sex called stromal tumor. They're, about 10% of them are hormonally active, about 10% of them are um, malignant in adults, but uh, in kids it's probably a little bit less. There are just only case reports of uh, this tumor being malignant in kids. Interestingly, about one third of these kids, they have some sort of syndrome, like putz jagger or Carney syndrome. There is a variant of it, it's called large cell calcifying tumor of the testis that is also benign. Anyways, uh, in the ones that are malignant, usually you can tell uh, by uh, the pathology through vascular invasion, high metodic fever, and size that are more than five centimeters. And they usually occur in older boys. Yes. Yes. Uh, they make testosterone or estrogen. So these patients can also um, uh, present with um, gynecomastia and precocious puberty. Sertoli cells. cells. And they're sertoli cells. Don't ask me why. I don't know. Because sertoli cells, they're not supposed to produce any performance. Yes, you're right. And the, even at the level of immunohistochemistry, they're very, very close to Leydig cells um, because um, they, uh, they actually, you can stain them for inhibit. Um, and inhibit should be in them, but not in Leydig cells. So there is a crossover here. I think these are actually immature cells from the kind of like a multipotential cells in the stroma that can go either way and they have kind of stop in the middle, they don't know where to go, be late, they go certainly. Um, <clears throat> another interesting uh, testicular pathology in kids is carcinoma in situ. It's um, common in adolescents with, uh, in adults with uh, gel cell tumor and when you do an orchidectomy in an adult for a gel cell tumor, the remainder of the testis is usually containing this um, uh, pathology in Skekabek, um, first described in 1975, and um, there are a lot of uh, data out there that they are actually malignant precursors of Gerson tumors. These are seen um, really in prepubertal pre germs of tumors. Even if we see these, they are more like hyperplastic lesions than neoplastic lesions because the malignancy markers such as uh, placental, um, alkaline phosphatase or sickit is are usually negative in this um, uh, lesions. Um, about 1.7% of adults with a history of undescended testis when you biopsy them uh, will have CIS, but um, they are rare in prepubertal biopsy of the testicles. And uh, that um, leads to the general um, approach of this uh, pediatric abnormalities, which is observation, um, as opposed to when you have an intratubular um, germ cell neoplasia in adults, um, you know, observation, radiation, or surgery, they have all been used. But in kids, they can be followed. The clinical findings of tumors in uh, Kids are very similar to other uh, to adults. Usually, they are presenting as a painless mass. There, in ten percent of them, there is a history of hernia hydrocele, and up to fifty percent of them may actually have a hydrocele at the time of presentation. And again, with hormonally active tumors like Leydig and Sertoli cells, 
there is um, a precocious pu pu puberty organic mastia uh, associated uh, with other findings. The diagnosis is usually done through a um, high definition um, ultrasound and Doppler. Um, ultrasound becomes very important in kids because really in adults when you have a um, positive ultrasound for a testicular tumor, the next step is quite obvious most of the time. And that's an inguinal orchidectomy. In kids, you try to use an ultrasound to stratify them, see if you can find benign lesions so you can do a spare, uh, sorry, testicular sparing surgery. But unfortunately, there's no 100% reliable features that they can distinguish between benign and malignant tumors in kids. Well, if you have an, uh, an, an an echoic cyst um, with no nothing in which is kind of homogeneous, nothing inside. These are usually benign. The uh, and the typical onion skin appearance is seen in um, epidermoid cysts, and this is because of the layers of keratin inside the cyst. If the um, tumor is oval or round with sharp edges and low flowing Doppler, this is again a soft sign. This could be benign. Uh, one other uh, good <coughs> characteristic of ultrasound is you can evaluate how much good testicle you have if you're considering um, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> testicular sparing surgery. This is the ultrasound of the epidermoid cyst, and that's the typical um, onion skin appearance of layers of creatinine inside the tumor. So you see this, um, then you can probably consider doing a... Um, Test is sparing surgery. The other interesting um, thing about um, testicular tumors in general is the use, clinical use of tumor markers. Um, again, as uh, it's different in kids and adults. First of all, uh, human chorionic gonadotropin or HCG is not usually a useful uh, tumor marker in prepubertal cases because uh, the type of cells that are producing this tumor marker are not common in kids. These are embryonal cell carcinoma or choriocarcinoma. On the other hand, AFP is actually very useful. About in, depending where you look, uh, 90 to 100% of um, yolk sac tumor in kids are producing uh, alpha fetoprotein. But again, in kids, it's not as straightforward because the levels, are, um, the levels of um, this tumor marker could be well above the normal range up to age of eight months. As a matter of fact, in the four, four months and uh, the first four months of uh, life, the liver is still producing this. So they don't achieve the stable T half of the five days that we typically use uh, by, in, by age four to six months. So whenever we see an AFP, we have to always take this into account. Um, I think in rare cases it could be positive and I don't think any downside to it to get it anyway so no I'm not advocating not to get it but usually it's not useful and you don't see anything in the pre-pubertal cases in post-pubertal cases absolutely it should be part of the uh, uh, workup uh, <coughs> In terms of staging, uh, well, like, again, adults, we use CT chest or abdomen, and in some cases, like in our institution, sometimes to reduce the uh, amount of um, radiation given to the kids because they're going to need a lot of imaging, we do a CT chest and an MRI abdomen. Uh, another pitfall here in kids is that um, usually the prepubertal kids, they will need um, general anesthetic to get this cross-sectional imaging. And um, so there, a lot of them are intubated, and this caused some atelectasis in the in, in, in the lungs, which could mask um, pulmonary mets. So that's another challenge that we, we have in kids. The staging system that is being used in most of the pediatric centers are also is also different from what the TNM system that we use in um, adult cases. 
It's uh, mm, simplified, so we have a stage one that, is, that means there's no disease beyond the testis, negative tumor markers, and uh, negative lymph nodes. And negative lymph nodes means clinically uh, they are negative on the CT scan, or if they're positive on the CT scan more than two centimeters, you have to biopsy them. Be sure it's negative before you can say this patient is a stage one. In a stage two, you have macroscopic residual and, or elevated markers or tumor rupture or scrotal biopsy. Um, so that's important. You can see scrotal approach will upstage the tumor and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, if uh, there is a positive uh, retroperitoneal nodes, um, uh, especially if they are over four centimeters and you have a stage three between two and four centimeters. Again, you have, you need a biopsy to uh, confirm this stage. And stage four is distant metastasis. So let's talk about a practical approach to these tumors. What do you do if you see a, a child with a testicular tumor? Uh, first thing is that you have to remember the management, again, of the pre cases are different. The post-pubertal cases of kids that are tanner stage four and five, uh, it's basically the same, follows the same principles as adults' cases. So we, I'm just gonna focus a little bit more on the pre-pubertal testicular mass. In these cases, we all, you should always first consider test as a sparing surgery. So you need tissue to make the diagnosis. Uh, in adults and post-pubertal, usually you get the tissue from inguinal uh, radical orchidectomy, in prepubertal cases, you may consider uh, testis sparing, again, because most of these are benign. So we consider that this ultrasound shows adequate amount of normal testis. The tumor markers are negative or below, for AFP, below 100 nanograms uh, in infants. And there is no evidence of ex extra testicular disease. If you start a testicular sparing operation and you doubt it, you can always use intra-op frozen section. And the frozen section has been shown to have good reliability uh, in terms of um, uh, the final outcome, the final pathology. Uh, but the problem is sampling error. Uh, because in big teratomas, there could be just foci of uh, yolk sac tumor that you may miss at your frozen section. But these are rare occurrences. For small lesions deep in the um, body of the testis, um, you can use intra-op ultrasound, and we've done that a few times. So, Coach, were there instances where you would do a partial and not get any frozen sections at the same time? Most of the time, yeah. Most of the time, we don't get frozen sections. If, if um, um, grossly we are satisfied this is an epidermoid cyst or a teratoma or something like that. Um, well, the, the teratomas and epidermoid cysts, they actually shell out. You don't have to take any of the tubules around them. If I have to take a tubules and they are not shelling out, for sure I'll get then a frozen section and I'll get some margin around it. Um, important point is that the testicular sparing surgery, again, is an inguinal surgery. Uh, there has been cases lately that have been referred to us and people thought, okay, we're going to do a um, testis sparing surgery. This is a benign uh, thing, so we're going to go scrotal. And then it turned out to be not benign. So we always use inguinal incision. We control the cord uh, with the pendrose around it. We deliver the testicles after. We manip manip manipulate the testicle right after the not before the cord is controlled. And then um, the testis is, del is delivered to the incision and we incise the tunica albuginea. Now the incision is made either right on top of the tumor, if it, you can't really find the tumor, you have to bivalve the tunica, uh, tunica albuginea and try to find the tumor that way. Um, but you have to make sure that you get your ultrasound beforehand. Once the tunica Albuginia is open, you can't really get a good ultrasound to locate uh, the small tumors. And then the tumor is removed and the capsule is repaired. Okay, so you have done this, now you have pathology. 
Um, but then you can proceed with the rest of the management. Um, so if the pathology comes back teratoma, these are usually, I mean, almost always uh, benign, so no further treatment. And in some books and studies, they say actually no further follow-up is needed in these patients. Uh, we still see this patient a few, uh, a few times before we discharge them. This is because, as I said, there is no association with carcinoma in situ, and there has been no met local recurrence if these are resected completely. Um, the longest study has a median follow-up of seven years, and they haven't seen any of these. Uh, these tumors rarely may contain foci of um, yolk sac tumor. In that situation, you usually know preoperatively by, um, by an elevated a AFB. So you, in that situation, you don't do it. It's test is sparing uh, surgery. This is a case of mine. Um, this patient had a huge teratoma on the other testes um, on the right side and underwent an inguinal orchidectomy. There was nothing to save. And this is his left testis. I don't know if you can see it, if it's projected well, but um, he had a four millimeter, five millimeter cystic lesion in the other testis. So this one, uh, you, when we opened, um, and delivered it inguinally, we couldn't even see anything on the surface. We used intra-operative um, ultrasound, we located it. Uh, I had to bivalve basically the testicle to get this. I took it out and then this is uh, the same testicle eight months later down the road, totally normal. Um, so they, they, can, they can actually recover very well. Dr. McClough. Yes, yeah, that, that, that's right. Um, the, uh, if I'm really, as I said, if I'm <clears throat> really worried about positive or negative margin, I just take the testicle out. I don't go for a sp uh, spring. But if I do that and still I'm worried, then I can get frozen section. In these tumors, when you open them, they actually, they just pop out. They're not that hard to dissect. Usually they just, you, you put your... A, um, a small snap or something around them and you open it and they just shell out this epidermoid cyst or teratoma. So, uh, and then uh, if they do that, most likely they are benign, so then we are not worried about positive margin again. You have a cord clamped Yes, correct. Well, it, uh, I think it makes the um, dissection easier because it's bloodless field. Um, we can probably do most of this in like less than 10 minutes. As I said, they shell out very easily. Uh, and I don't know if, John, you have had any cases that you could not shell them out and uh, you left tumor behind. No, I haven't. I was going to say the issue of the margin, I think the more critical question is what the underlying pathology is. Well. Correct. The, the other thing is that if, you, if, the fro, uh, if the final pathology comes back something malignant that you miss, you can always go back and take the testicle out. It's not that hard, and you have not upstaged the patient. This is another case, a one-year-old male uh, who actually presented for um, um, uh, undescended testis. He had non-palpable testis on one side, and a palpable big testis and a scrotum on the other side. Uh, I did a laparoscopy on him. Uh, I found a nubbin intra-abdominally that was taken out. And then this uh, tumor was um, also taken out. Uh, again, same technique. And it, it was a teratoma. Uh, and uh, the other ultrasound is the same testicles one year down the road. Um, good size and no uh, evidence of any problems. In this case, because uh, I remember I actually did frozen section because of the size and it's, it was a little bit unusual. It, it was a single uh, testis. I didn't want to come back. So I did frozen section in these cases and they, they told me it was teratoma.
Epidermoid cysts are also um, kind of like a teratoma. They're not associated with carcinoma in situ or metastasis, and surgical excision is usually all you need. York sac tumor is a little bit different. Um, staging in these cases are very important. The other central, uh, the other main difference between York sac tumor in preparatory cases and adults is that the RPLND does not really have a central role. Why? Because mostly these cases are stage one. They are not uh, spread to the retroperitoneum where they are diagnosed, 70 to 80 percent of them. They are predominantly pure histology as opposed to mixed histology that is commonly seen in adults. Um, we have a good tumor marker for follow-up AFP and also uh, blood-borne metastases are much more common in kids than in adults. About 20% of these kids um, may have long mets um, when they are presenting and about half of them don't have any nodes in their abdomen. Uh, RPLND is also more mo uh, morbid in the small kids. And if you have a relapse after orchidectomy, and during um, surveillance, there is excellent response to chemo. So for these reasons, in the last uh, two or three uh, decades, people have shied away from doing a full-fledged RPLND in prepubertal kids. No, uh, residual mass. Af no, we we'll get to that in a second. So there, there are RPLND, um, like. Uh, indications for RPN, and that's one of them. So if you have a confirmed stage one, usually these kids go to surveillance, there are different regimens, but chest X-ray tumor markers, CT and MRI of the chest of abdomen have been used with different um, frequency every three months for first two years, every four months for first two years, and then every six months, and usually most centers um, follow them uh, for at least five years, but more likely through adult adulthood. Um, at stage two and above, uh, they get uh, a platinum-based uh, chemotherapy. RPLND is used in this case if you have evidence of residual or recurrent disease. That after chemo, then RPLND is uh, indicated. The six-year event-free survival rate for a stage two to four of these diseases is anywhere between 85 to 100 percent. So it's very rare to get death from these diseases. And as a matter of fact, a lot of deaths that has been reported in these studies are actually from chemotherapy, for, from the treatment, not the disease itself. Um, survival is a slightly worse for post-pubertal patient, and that's probably because a lot of them have a mixed germ pathology, um, about, which is seen in about 80% of them, actually. I'm pretty sure uh, scrotal biopsies are part of the stage. That makes it stage two. Yes. Some of them do, yes. So you have to go back in, in terms of, in um, um, uh, yolk sac tumor, you have to at least do, get the rest of the code out and, and take the scar out and then they will, up, they will be upstaged to stage two. So they get chemo. So that's why it's very important to not approach these tumors um, scrotally. In rhabdomyosarcoma, actually, the upper stage to stage three sometimes. So um, this is a case um, that Peter and I are going to do next week. This is a York sac tumor. Actually, this is actually post puberty. This guy is 15 years old. But um, this is his original tumor. This guy sat on this tumor for nine months. He had this tumor in his testicle, and he knew about it for nine months. When I asked him why he didn't tell anyone. He said, I googled it and I thought it was hydrocele. So I didn't tell anyone. So he, then he showed up with a big mass in his abdomen and meds everywhere. Uh, and this is actually his post-chemo MRI and you can see a huge residual mass here. So this guy is going for RPLND. Well, um, you tell me, what do you do in these cases uh, with this post-chemo? Well, post-chemo, there is one template. Yeah. A child who's smaller, I guess, do you go through every year? Or do you actually just give up? 
I think I think in this case we're just gonna start with the lumpectomy, and if we can um, save that kidney over there, it's fine. But in, in no, in kids like the RPLNDs that we do usually for like rhabdomyosarcoma, we actually use the template that you use. So um, ureter to ureter, um, nothing below IMA, and con and ipsilateral side down to the iliacs. So we you know we use the same template if you want to do a template. Um, in kids, actually, nerve sparing is also done, and it's, uh, it's actually sometimes easier because there's not much fat in the retroperitoneum, and you can see the nerves and identify the nerves a little bit better. Um, I don't know, John, if you, um, like the last couple of cases you did, uh, did you do template or did you do a full? So um, we get to the rhabdomyosarcoma, um, but um, if you have a sex uh, stromal tumors, uh, usually the Leydig cells or the granulosa cell tumor resection is all you need. Unfortunately for the Leydig and uh, the um, Sertoli cells that are hormonally active, the precocious puberty uh, for, some for some reason is not reversible. So if these kids are diagnosed late and they're a bone plate is all is already fused. They're gonna usually end up with short stature and things like that. With Sertoli cells, if you resect them and the histology is suspicious, especially in older boys, then a full metastatic workup should be done. Testis is sparing uh, may be done safely in younger kids with uh, Sertoli cell. Yeah, well, in studies, in uh, the, well, first of all, there are very few of them. There's, there are only like, I don't know, 20 cases reported as malignant Sertoli cells in kids, but most of them were uh, showing uh, evidence of either vascular invasion, high metodic fevers, and size. And when they, they were some correlation between this pathological finding and eventual clinical course. Um, Yes. Dr. McClough. Uh, years ago when we were looking for it, we always go back to prostate. Prostate tumor, we thought Nova had the Nova back. Pardon me, I, I couldn't hear you. Years ago we were looking mm. for a, a prostate tumor. Bob mm. Nova had a, a Nova back on the UBC, so I went and visited him. And we, we started using his lab in the lab. But he also had a lytic cell tumor. And the interesting thing about the lytic cell tumor is that this hormone that but it also produces hernias. All these rats have massive hernias. So what I was asking you is that you try to step in and go there, of course, but hernias are hormonally dependent. So do you, have you seen any hernias in the lytic cell tumor? That's really interesting. No, I haven't. I've seen only last seven years, six and a half years I've been at Children's, I've seen only two lytic tumors, but uh, no. No, I haven't seen a hernia. Because That's very I interesting. Mm. Is it uh, because it interferes with uh, the descent of the testicles and I don't know? No, I can't recall anything like that. I don't know about you, John. Have you? I've never seen two in my life and I don't know Or Jenny, I don't know if you have seen any. Another beast that uh, we have to deal with uh, from time to time is paratesticular rhabdomyosarcoma. Um, it is about 5% of the scrotal testicular tumors. It has two peaks, one in three to four months of age, and then again in 16 years of age. About 40% of this tumor have metasta um, metastatic um, foci at, the, at diagnosis. It arises from the mesenchymal tissue f uh, of the distal cord, epididymis, or the covering layers of the testis. So they are not per se testicular tumor. That's why we call it paratesticular. Um, about 90% of these uh, tumors are embryonal variant. Do you know that rhabdomyosarcoma has two or three main um, histology type? Embryonal, which is seen in usually in GU, like prostate and uh, paratesticular area, 
as a general rule, they have better prognosis than the alveolar type that you see in the extremities and trunk. And there's also a uh, undifferentiated um, type that is very malignant. Um, what is uh, nice about rhabdomyosarcoma, if you can say that, is that it's a distinct pathology. So diagnosis, um, pathological diagnosis is very reliable. They have um, specific electron microscopy characteristic. They actually can see the Z bands of the myosin in these uh, cells. And also there are um, many immunohistochemistry um, Markers again, uh, such as myosin and bimentin and things like that. Um, usually in pathology, you see uh, sheets of uh, immature myo myoblasts uh, with bizarre uh, nuclei, depending on the degree of uh, anaplasia. They usually present as a scrotal mass, and they're usually so big that uh, you can't tell what, what is what, but sometimes you can tell them apart in your physical examination from the testis, um, like it's sitting on top of the testis, but sometimes it's, you can't tell which is which. And you can't tell, is the testicle actually large as well? Or just the cord? No, it's just usually cord, and the testis is usually squished to one, one side. Um, so the management starts in these cases with inguinal orchidectomy. Uh, if you do a scrotal orchidectomy, then later on you have to go remove the cord, do at least a partial or in some cases a total hemiscrotectomy. And as we talked, this upstages the tumor uh, to stage two or three. So they're going to they're gonna have uh, more treatment. Um, CT scan is again used uh, routinely for staging. Um, I just simplify the management here. If you if you see positive nodes uh, in CT scan, the, up to ninety percent of them are positive in pathology. And if you see a negative CT, in some studies, the IRS studies, which is a North American study, um, the fast negative rate when you correlate it with node sampling afterwards is fifteen percent. In a German study, which is a more recent study, is two to three percent. Um, is that because the German study is newer and better imaging was used? We don't know. Um, again, f full RPLND is morbid in these kids uh, with the complication rates up to 25%. Most commonly, ileus mechanical obstruction uh, and then a problem with ejaculation, um, bleeding and infection. Template and nervous sparing RPLNDs have been used in these kids, but in some studies, especially in Europe, they actually just do a template node sampling. So they don't go and basically uh, clean uh, aorta and cava uh, all around and take all the nodes out, and, and they have had the similar results in terms of cancer control. And the rationale is that this is a staging procedure, not a treatment procedure. Your treatment is actually your chemotherapy. The only difference is that if these nodes come back positive, then the patient is going to get more chemo and radiation. So there are four good studies or series of studies out there uh, from uh, the international, um, uh, sorry, in, uh, I think it's intergroup, rhabdomyosarcoma study for Italian and German cooperative group and SIOP, um, which is a Société Internationale uh, Oncologie Pédiatrique, it's a European uh, conglomerate of all the centers. They have shown that the relapse-free survival of patients over 10 years of age are lower than younger boys. So even in rhabdomyosarcoma, um, older age is a risk factor. In these kids, RPLND or lymph node sampling should be done um, for staging purposes. Uh, the only time if you don't do the RPLN is that when the CT scan is come positive. If the nodes are positive, then they're going to get an intensified chemo, which usually includes an alkylating agent and radiation. With this current approach, the overall survival rate is actually 90%. So I guess um, that's um, all I have. Um, if there are take-home messages, I 
I'd like to say that the pre, again reiterate that the prepubertal tumors are different even if they are malignant than the adults and they are approached differently. There is no place for a scrotal approach uh, since malignancy cannot be ruled out at, uh, at the onset when you see this case. So no testicular, that's mainly for the residents, so don't approach any testicular tumor scrotally. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, if a scrotal mass is identified in children, um, I firmly believe this should be referred to a pediatric center. I'm not talking about the surgery part of it, but uh, the oncology um, resources that we have. Uh, for example, in busy children's, you wouldn't even believe it. Uh, we look like uh, peanuts in uh, the whole department of surgery looks like a peanut when compared to oncology over there. Um, <clears throat> I think that's all I have uh, to say. Thank you very much. And don't do that. <laughs>